us. Today we're going to be in Luke chapter 23, where we're going to go through a little bit more about the crucifixion and how forever with God was promised to us, and it was made possible because of the crucifixion, but permanent because of the resurrection. You know, we, we talked a little bit about Jesus um, being on the cross, and you know, you ever have those moments in life where you get knocked down and you try to get back up? Well, getting back up is hard. But I really do love a good comeback story. One of my favorite comeback stories is when I went to Dunkin' Donuts and then I came back for more. It's one of my favorites of all time. No, but seriously, I'm an Avengers fan, but I'm not like a super Avengers fan to where I don't read the comics, and that's okay. Uh, I accept that as it is. But I do enjoy the movies. Um, Got all the movies for Christmas, so I watched them through a couple times, and that's a really good series. But Iron Man, of course, is one of my favorites, not my favorite of all time. Star-Lord is now my favorite of all time. Chris Pratt, you know, we're both good-looking guys. We're both hilarious. We kind of connect with each other. I'm kidding. But anyways... You know that. You're like, joke is on you, Rick. So I love a comeback story. Well, Robert Downey Jr., of course, plays Iron Man. And now we're in the middle of this, well, not in the middle, the end game of the Avengers series where we're going to see what kind of comeback they're going to have. But Robert Downey Jr., who plays Iron Man himself, he was nominated for an Academy Award in 1992. And then he battled this drug addiction for five years. He was sentenced to prison. I mean, he was knocked down in life, about as low as you could possibly go. And then he comes back and he stars in uh, the Avengers series and he's Iron Man. And it's one, of the, it's one of the greatest comeback stories like in our culture today. But that has nothing on the comeback story of Jesus. Here is Jesus hanging on the cross being ridiculed, persecuted, lied about, hated, and yet it was through these sufferings and through this persecution that he actually triumphed and he actually won. You know, Proverbs chapter 6 says, a lying, deceitful tongue is something that God hates. God hates people who devise wicked schemes and who make plots in their heart and try to cause division amongst brethren. And so here is Jesus suffering one of the most heinous crimes known in the Old Testament. And this might be familiar to you. It means to bear false witness. It's when you give false testimony about a person and you say lies and you slander them so that they can be incarcerated and incriminated and prosecuted for something that they never did. And here was Jesus being arrested in secret, brought before the religious leaders of his day in secret, tried for blasphemy in secret, slandered in secret, and ultimately hanging on a cross for something he didn't even do. I don't know if you've ever been lied about or if anyone's ever slandered you. But if you have been, you know, it doesn't feel too great. I mean, you want to plead your innocence. You want to stand up for yourself. You want to say, no, I'm right, you're wrong. I really didn't do these things. But yet Jesus suffers through the cross for our own victory. And so we can know we are forgiven, not forsaken. And it's because of the cross, forever with God was promised to us. And it's because of the resurrection, forever with God was made permanent. Matthew has a little bit to say about the passion story, and Luke does as well, and I have it up on the screen for you. It says in Matthew chapter 27, verses 39 through 40, we see this group of rebellious people insulting Jesus. It says, those who passed by heaped abuse on him, shaking their heads and saying, you said you're going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Save yourself. If you really are the son of God, come down from the cross. In Jesus' life, he made this prophecy. He said, I'm going to destroy the temple and I'm going to rebuild it in three days. The Jews thought he was talking about the physical temple, but Jesus was talking about his own body, that he would die and three days later he would resurrect from the dead. And here's what's so interesting about these rebellious people. One week earlier, Jesus had entered Jerusalem on a donkey and they were worshiping him and praising him and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And five days later, they're now heaping curses and insults upon Jesus. And because of the 21st century, I like to think that they have all this attitude when it says they're wagging their heads and snapping their fingers, but I don't really think that's probably what they're doing. They probably don't have a bunch of attitude. They just have malicious, mocking, insulting, terrible, degrading attitude as they see Jesus hanging naked on a cross. The rebellious people didn't recognize Jesus for who he truly was. They thought he would do and be one thing, but yet he was something entirely different. Jesus was not recognized by the rebellious people. I wonder if you and I recognize who Jesus truly is. 
But it wasn't enough for him to be insulted by the people who praised him in one breath. Even the religious leaders, the ones who were supposed to do what was right, the ones who were supposed to walk the thin line, the ones who were supposed to set the example, are now the very ones who are corrupt and malicious and insulting and blasphemous. And they point up to Jesus and they insult him in the very same way. Look what Luke actually goes on to say. They said to Jesus in Luke 23, 35, the rulers sneered at him saying, he saved others, meaning he physically healed him, them. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen one. Matthew adds, the chief priests and scribes and elders mocked him. You see, it wasn't enough for them to crucify Jesus. No, now they must absolutely humiliate him. The idea of mocking comes from Psalm chapter 22, where it gives us really poetic imagery of what the coming servant would, would suffer. And it says that he actually assumed a role lower than human. To die on a cross for Jews and to be naked, you were considered somebody who wasn't even human, less than a worm is the, is the, are the words that are used. And so here are the rebellious people, here are the religious leaders mocking and accusing and insulting Jesus because they don't really recognize who Jesus is. And then we have the Roman soldiers, the people who are supposed to be impartial. They've lied about Jesus. They've prosecuted Jesus. They've sentenced Jesus to death. They've beat him and humiliated him and spit upon him. I mean, he has gone through the worst thing you could ever imagine going through. And it wasn't enough for him to hang on a cross. Now they gamble for his clothes and they strip him naked and they curl insults at him. Look what Luke goes on to say in verse 36. Even the soldiers also mocked him and came up to offer him sour wine. If you are the king of the Jews, they said, save yourself. This sour wine, in their opinion was the drink that was fitting for that kind of king. The Bible goes on to say that they took a sign and they inscribed the king of the Jews on the top of it and they mounted it above Jesus' head and they worshipped him and they mocked him and they laughed at him and they even gave him the worst kind of drink you could ever give, this disgusting, sour perfume. It was like vinegar and Jesus didn't take it. They didn't recognize who Jesus really was. And now to the main part of the story, what I want to talk about this morning are the robbers. You see, they wanted to humiliate Jesus to the ultimate extreme, and so they probably found two robbers who were due for the death penalty, and they brought them with Jesus so that their persecution and their punishment would be a little bit earlier. And I think that was probably one of the reasons why they hated Jesus so much. And so they are going to be cru crucified with Jesus because Jesus is nothing more in the eyes of the Roman government, the religious leaders, the rebellious people, nothing more than a common criminal. And here's Jesus hanging on the cross, crying out, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And it wasn't enough that the rebellious people mocked Jesus. It wasn't enough that the religious leaders and the Roman soldiers mocked Jesus. Oh, no. Now it's the robbers who are crucified with him. Look what the Bible says. Matthew says in the same way, even the robbers were crucified with him and berated him. You ever been berated before? Openly mocked, publicly mocked? And in one particular moment, Luke specifically details this. He says, one of the criminals who hung there heaped abuse on him. Are you not the Christ, he said? Save yourself and us. Matthew uses the word blasphemy. He is blaspheming Jesus. He's attributing this innocent man who did the wondrous works of God to nothing, to worthlessness, to insults. If you really are who you say you are, you could save us, but you're not. In other words, is what he implied. But then something happened. One thief, who Matthew says started out insulting Jesus, heard all of these insults cast upon, the, upon Jesus, heard the Romans and the religious leaders and the rebellious people insult him. Even this thief who was on the other side insult him. But something changed in this man's heart. And instead of being unable to recognize who Jesus really was, he instead turned and looked upon himself. And he was repentant. And he changed. It says this, look what the robber says. But the other one rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God since you are under the same judgment? We are punished justly, for we are receiving what our actions deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He did what we call in the church, he repented. A lot of people think repentance means to simply confess your sins, but that's not at all what repentance means. That's confession. Repentance means to change your attitude about 
and he changes his attitude about two things. The first thing is he changes his attitude about himself. He looks at this robber who is being crucified with Jesus, who's suffocating, who's getting ready to stand before God once he dies, and he says, don't you even fear God? You know, it's amazing what can happen to us when our hearts get so hard to where we can even be on our deathbed ready to meet God, and yet we refuse to recognize who Jesus truly is. And maybe you've experienced life situations in your own heart and your own life that's caused you to be disappointed with God or angry at God or rebellious towards God. And I want to encourage you, look at the position of this robber. Here he is, hanging with an innocent man, and he can't even see it. How many of us would plead our innocence? But Jesus didn't. How many of us would cry out for forgiveness for the people who have beat and crucified us? Not too many of us. Jesus is an innocent man, and yet this robber's heart is so hard. But then we look at this other robber. He changes his view about himself, and look what he says. He says, we are receiving the penalty that we deserve for the crimes that we committed. These guys didn't just steal, but to be a robber, the Greek word actually means that they used violence in their thievery, that they probably actually maliciously attacked or even killed someone in their attempt to steal from other people. And here he is hanging on the cross and a switch is flipped in his mind and he sees Jesus as he truly is and he turns away from himself and he says, I am a guilty man. I deserve this, but he doesn't. He says, we are punished justly for we are receiving what our actions deserve. You know, admitting your sin is the first step in the repentance process. To change your attitude about yourself and the things that you've done, even though we might be hurt by God or hurt by situations and scenarios, to be able to look up at God and say, God, I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I've done things that are wrong, but I am hurt by you. God, change my heart. Change my attitude about myself. Help me not only see you as you truly are, but me as I truly am. And then something else changed. He was able to change his attitude about himself because he changed his perception and attitude about Jesus. Look what he says about Jesus. He says, Jesus, you are an innocent man. Even in Jesus' death on the cross, everyone else thought Jesus was being cursed by God, but this thief was able to see Jesus as he truly was. God was not uh, refuting the cross. He was using the cross to bring about reconciliation between us and God. And the thief on the cross saw that. He was able to see that the cross was not a hurdle to the Messiah reigning. It was a path to the Messiah reigning. And he embraced the cross in this moment. He changed his view on Jesus. The first thing he says is, Jesus is innocent. This man has done nothing wrong. You know when Jesus stood before Pilate, do you know what Pilate said about Jesus? I find no charge against you. And so Pilate sends Jesus to Herod. And you know what Herod said about Jesus? I find nothing about this man that could stick. These these accusations are not true. Even later on in the Passion story, after Jesus dies, a Roman guard looks up and says, this was truly a righteous man. They were able to see that Jesus was innocent, yet he suffered. Why did he suffer? He suffered for you and he suffered for me. So he was able to see that Jesus was innocent. And you know, the Bible says in Hebrews 4, 15, that Jesus was tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. Perfect, innocent person. He changed his attitude, but he was also able to to see this, that Jesus was the eternal king. How many of us would look at someone under this type of persecution and say, that's the kind of guy I want to follow? Or I trust that everything's going to work out for him. I mean, so many of us have fallen captive and pray to this health and wealth gospel that if we become a Christian, he'll make us healthy and wealthy and nothing bad will ever happen to us. But the thief on the cross was able to recognize Jesus for who he truly was because he saw Jesus at his worst moment in his life and he saw a king. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. When we were able to recognize who Jesus truly is, We're able to repent and turn away from our sins and see who we truly are. And we're able to place our faith and our trust in the one who died on the cross for our sins. How does Jesus respond? I mean, think about it. Could you and I stand at the foot of the cross and see what happened to Jesus? And I am ashamed to say that I would probably turn the other way. Maybe you watched the Passion of the Christ this weekend. I've only seen it one time in my entire life because it is so brutal and so gruesome, but it's historically accurate and reliable. What they did to Jesus was horrific. And I don't know if I would be able to look at Jesus on the cross. And I'm ashamed to say that. I'm ashamed to say that he died for my sin, that he suffered in my place. 
but nevertheless, I accept it and I embrace it because he offers it to me freely. And yet, how does Jesus respond? Here's this thief cursing him in one breath, but yet having a change of heart in the very next, ready to die on his deathbed. And look at what Jesus says in verse 43. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me where? In paradise. You see, it was through the cross that forever with God was not a future hope, but a present reality. The thief on the cross used the word when, Jesus used today. When is God willing to give you mercy? It's today. When are you able to push restart and refresh with God? You can do that today. It is not some future hope that you have to place your, your, your ability in or your thought process in or your good works in. Oh no, it can be a present reality today. And he promises the thief on the cross this, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise was this word that they got from the Persians and they transitioned it into Greek. And it meant this, this eternal abode for those who are righteous, those who are with God. It was pictured in the Old Testament as this garden, this place where we go and we dwell and we are happy with God forever. And the thief on the cross has promised that. And that same thing is promised to you and is promised to me. If we're willing to recognize who Jesus is and repent and turn away from our sins, if we are willing to come to the cross through faith, we can receive the salvation of our souls. Now, a lot of people say, hey, look, thief on the cross didn't have to be baptized. You know, doesn't that mean that we don't have to be baptized? There's a few things that I'd like to say about that. The first thing is this. The thief on the cross didn't just do nothing. He met two necessary conditions for, the old, for, for salvation under the Old Testament. Number one, he turned away from his sin. He changed his attitude about himself. Number two, he had faith in Christ. He chose to trust in God, that he was king and he would have a kingdom. And so he does meet those two necessary conditions. We don't know if the thief on the cross was not baptized under John. We simply don't have that information. But here's, here's, the, here's, here's what's most interesting. As a lot of people point to the thief on the cross as some type of anomaly for us not to have to be baptized, when the thief on the cross was never commanded to be baptized in Jesus' name. The thief on the cross died in 30 AD next to Jesus. It doesn't matter if you died three minutes or 3,000 years before Jesus died. The command to be baptized in Jesus' name was never given by the apostles until 50 days after Jesus' death. And so here's the thief on the cross throwing himself upon the mercy and the grace of God, placing his faith in Jesus with a repentant heart and a changed attitude. And in this moment, he receives divine forgiveness. In Acts chapter 2, that same promise is offered to us. Peter is standing and he's preaching the gospel and he's telling Israel, look, this Jesus that you crucified, he's actually your Lord. He's actually your Christ. And they are so convicted, it says in Acts 2, 36, they are pierced to the heart, they are sick to their stomach, and in verse 37, they cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? And Peter says, repent, change the attitude about your sin, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, and you shall receive the remission of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Does that mean that God can't save anyone outside of baptism? Absolutely not. Does that mean we're not saved by grace through faith at the time of baptism? Absolutely not. But now God, and we would expect this under the new covenant, has added an additional condition. Faith, repentance, and baptism. We are saved by God's grace through the channel of faith at the time of baptism with a repentant heart that we may have good works for Jesus. One of the most powerful passages of Scripture is in Hebrews chapter 9. And, and Paul says this, The testament, the will of a person, cannot come into effect until after the death of the testator. And what that means is Jesus' will was not probated until after he died, 50 days later on the day of Pentecost. So of course, baptism wasn't commanded. Just like it wasn't commanded for Adam, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or any of the other Old Testament prophets. But we can't, get, we can't get distracted by those little rabbit trails. What we need to pay attention to is simply this, to recognize who Jesus is, to approach him with a repentant heart, to meet him on his conditions. The same promise of eternal life that was offered to the thief on the cross is the same promise that's offered to you and to me. You see, it's through the cross that forever with God is possible, but it's through the resurrection that forever with God is made permanent. And what does the thief do? He accepts it. Now, how was this made possible? Through the cross. 
And so the key phrase that I would summarize is simply this. By promising the thief on the cross paradise, Jesus was demonstrating that God's plan to accomplish through, not apart from, the cross. And if we want to get to the resurrection, we must pass through the cross. Now, what does all this crucifixion stuff mean about the resurrection? Well, I've got good news. You see, there are historical facts that were given through the New Testament that help us know that Jesus really did resurrect from the dead. Let me share a few of those with you. You know, when New Testament scholars, whether you're Christian or not, whether you're liberal or conservative, the New Testament scholars agree on four major historical facts about the resurrection. Fact number one is that Jesus was crucified and buried in a tomb by a guy named Joseph. That's a historical fact. It is something that is indisputable. And you know, before I was a Christian, anytime I'd hear somebody quote the Bible, I'd say, yeah, but that's just the Bible, man. It was written by Christians. Just because something is written by someone who is a Christian does not make it historically unreliable. That is extremely prejudiced. There are so many things that have been written by Christians that we accept as historically accurate. Why would we dismiss a historical document just because a Christian wrote it? I don't think that that's fair, and I don't think that that's honest. But here's the second thing. Let's even say, okay, the Bible isn't the Word of God. It's just mere historical documents. That's what these New Testament scholars have done. Get rid of the theological question. Let's approach the the Bible as a collection of independent historical documents. What facts are basically indisputable? And the first one is that Jesus was buried, uh, crucified and buried by a guy named Joseph. And that's what the Bible says. It says in Mark chapter 15, verses 42 through 45, when evening had already come because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council. So he's a religious elite. He's a very wealthy guy who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. So he's expecting the Messiah to usher in the kingdom. And he gathered up courage and he went before Pilate and he asked for the body of Jesus. Man, that would be tough. I am so thankful for doctors and nurses who are willing to, and EMTs who are willing to go when people have been injured bodily, when, they, when they've been wounded, and they're willing to take care of those who need it the most. And here's Joseph scrubbing Jesus' wounds, washing the blood off of his body and his face. And look what it goes on to say. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, and summoning the centurions who were at the cross, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And ascertaining this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph, and Joseph brought a linen cloth and took him down and wrapped him in the linen cloth and placed him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and he rolled this stone against the entrance of the tomb. This stone was was about two tons, about 2,000 to 3,000 pounds, and it was like a frisbee. So it wasn't a big boulder, but it was more like a disc, and they had this little divot that they would carve out of the stone. And what you would do when you wanted to seal this tomb, you would get your guys together, you'd unhitch the stone um, from its holding place, and you would push it, and it would roll down until it settled. And it would be a very, very strong um, ceiling for this, for this tomb. Nobody could get in, and more importantly, nobody could get out. That's fact number one. Another fact is simply this. On the Sunday after the crucifixion of Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his female followers. Look, even people who don't believe that Jesus is the Christ and they are not Christians, they agree on the first fact. Jesus died by crucifixion and was buried in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. Number two, Jesus was placed in a tomb and that tomb was found empty. Now, whether Jesus' disciples stole it or something else happened, that's, that's later on. But this is an indisputable fact. The tomb was found empty, but more importantly, by women followers. Now, ladies, I hope I'm not offensive to you because I don't believe this to be true um, for us today. But back in the Old Testament, unfortunately, women were not allowed to even testify in a court of law. They were highly prejudiced against women. And so it is like a stick of dynamite in history for Jesus' tomb to be discovered by a group or by by women followers. It's incredible. Because if you wanted people to trust the resurrection, the last thing that you would do is say Jesus' tomb was found empty by women. Let me read to you a quote by Josephus. He was a Jewish historian. This is what he had to say about women. He said, let not the testimony of women be admitted. Don't even admit it in a court of law. Why? Because of their sex, because of their gender. That was their mentality then. That's how they approach life. But through God's providence and Jesus' grace, he allows his tomb to be discovered by women, empty. 
This is what we call embarrassing testimony. How do we know the Bible gets it right? How do we know it's true? The last thing that you would do if you wanted people to accept the Bible and the story of Jesus is to have his tomb found empty by women followers. That's exactly what we find. And praise God, that's what we find. And John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, this is what it says. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. And then later on in the story, she runs back to the tomb and look at what Jesus had said to her. She's clinging to Jesus because she's experienced the risen Lord. And he says, stop clinging to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go and tell my brethren and say to them, I ascend to the Father and your Father and my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. You see, this demonstrates that the Bible gets it right because they wouldn't have included things that were embarrassing in their testimony. But they're not interested in what's embarrassing or not. They're interested in truth. Another fact that we have. Fact number four, on different occasions and under various circumstances, different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead. These people really did experience and see Jesus alive from the dead. Now, the theory is they lied about it, they hallucinated it, or it really actually did happen. And we'll talk about that in our concluding moments. But it is historically verifiable. The majority of New Testament scholars absolutely agree. These people experienced the risen Lord Jesus. You know, Jesus appeared to Peter. Paul confirmed that in Galatians chapter 1. Jesus appeared to the 12 disciples at once. Luke confirms that in Luke 24. Look what John chapter 20 says. Here's Thomas, who's a skeptic. Have you ever doubted Jesus' resurrection? Maybe you even do this morning. Well, Thomas was the same as you. In fact, Thomas says, unless I see evidence of the resurrection, unless I poke my finger in his hands and in his side, I refuse to believe. And look at what happens. Thomas says, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger, Jesus says. See my hands, reach here with your hands and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. You know, I'm not a Christian because I take a blind step in the darkness. I'm not a Christian because I believe in something in spite of evidence. I'm a Christian because I believe based on evidence. I trust in the things that I don't see because of the things that I do see. I trust in the unseen because the evidence that provided uh, by the apostles, they were eyewitnesses of who Jesus was. And they claimed to feel his wounds and touch his side. So Jesus appears to Thomas. The Bible goes on to say that Jesus appeared to 500 brethren at once. Let me read to you 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 was written by a guy named Paul formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. He persecuted the church. He hunted down Christians. He threw them in jail. He was a part of the religious elite for for the Jews. And it was his mission to bring the church down. He was a Jewish zealot and he hated Christianity and he wanted to prove it false and punish them. But something changed in Paul's life. Paul converted to Christianity. What was it? What could possibly cause a guy like Paul to give up his money, his religious status, his scholarship, his family history, to give up and forsake everything, to have his head laid down on a guillotine to be cut off. What would cause Paul to lose everything, gain nothing, yet convert to Christianity? Well, look at what Paul has to say in verse 3. Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he says this, For I have delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And look who he appeared to, Cephas and the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of who remain until now, but some have fallen asleep, some have died. Now if Paul writes this to the church at Corinth, and they wanted to disprove the resurrection, what could they do? They could go find these people who claimed to see Jesus, and they'd walk up to them, and they'd say, did you see Jesus? They'd say, no. Okay, case closed, settle. Paul is putting evidence on the line. If you want to believe in this truth, here are people who can testify to it. So he appears to Peter. He appears to the 12. He appears to 500 brethren at once, but he also appeared to more. Look what Paul goes on to say. 
Then he appeared to James, James, the brother of Jesus. James did not believe in Jesus during his ministry. In fact, he said Jesus was a lunatic. He's crazy. He's out of his mind. James was a skeptic. What happened to Paul? What happened to Thomas? What happened to James that caused these men to change their, their religion, to change their belief about Jesus and convert to Christianity? It wasn't just the cross. It was the resurrection. And then he says, and last of all, he appeared to me, one, untimely born, for I am the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. And so even skeptical scholar Gard Ludeman says this, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. You see, the cross made forever with God possible, but the resurrection made forever with God permanent. We now get to spend forever with God, not just because of the cross, but also the resurrection. You know, I myself, as a Christian, I've certainly doubted God's existence many times. I've struggled with my own inadequacy. I've got distracted, caught off guard by life situations that have happened in my life. And I wish I could say that becoming a Christian made everything easy, but it hasn't. It's been connected to the body, our church family that's brought us through. It's embracing God's forgiveness on the cross that has removed my guilt to allow me to forgive myself. It's the reminder that even when I feel most alone, I am forgiven, not forsaken. Even when life knocks me down, you and I are living a comeback story the second greatest comeback story of all time, that because of the cross, we get to spend forever with God. That's why Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, we will always be with the Lord. Forever is made possible. And so every Sunday we gather together to remember not just the resurrection of Jesus, but also the cross And in a few moments, there's going to be a tray that's passed around, and it's bread and it's juice. The bread represents the body of Jesus that was broken for us. The juice, the the grape juice represents his blood, which was poured out for us. And the night before Jesus died, he instituted the Lord's Supper, and he told his followers, do this in remembrance of me. And so that's why we're here. We're here to remember the Jesus who was crucified and also the Jesus who was resurrected for us forever with God was made possible because of the cross and permanent because of the resurrection.